All right, if you will open your copy of the Scriptures to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses, we'll be in verses 46 to 54. In your pew Bibles, that's uh, page 1076. 1076. John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Please allow me to pray. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your Spirit, please, at this time, not only speak through me, but work through your people. Father, please cause them understanding on this subject. I pray this in Christ's name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so our theme for this Lord's Day is belief. And that might seem like a simple topic, but, but really it's, it, it's not, right? I think this is something that we as people and we as the church can and will get wrong. This, in fact, is the core and the goal of this gospel, the gospel of John is belief. The, the, the main verse that's, that hovers over this book is John chapter 20, verse 31, which states, but these things, speaking of this gospel, and I know we've read this several times, and we're going to read it a whole lot more over the next months and years, however long it takes to get through this gospel. But these things were written so that, listen, you may believe. That's the key of this book. That's the theme. That you may believe, well, what are we to believe? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. John 3, 16 through 18 says this, <clears throat> For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Verse 18, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And same chapter, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. And turn over to chapter 6, if you're following with me. Chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 28 and 29. Therefore, they said to him, this is the crowd, what should we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to Me will never hunger, and he who believes in Me will never thirst. The call to obey here in our gospel is to believe it's the central theme around this whole book and it is our paragraph theme for today the greek word here for believe is pistuo it can also be translated as pistis depending on the context pistuo the idea of believing is not just a, a, it's not just intellectually only right it's it, it, but it is it entails the the matter of the heart 
Are, 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 are you truly involved? Are you truly in this? Do, do you trust with everything that you are? Because to believe here is to trust. And, and in this trust, it takes a person from being dead in their trespasses and sins to being made alive in Christ and sit it with Him in the heavenlies. And as we walk through verse 36 of of chapter 2, I gave the analogy of a bus trolley and how in some areas of the United States, they really don't travel much with cars that have buses that come. And there's these buses, they go real slow and you're able to put your foot on a bumper and grab a pole and just kind of jump up on it, right? So as it's coming by, you just reach out and grab and you put your foot up and it doesn't stop. It's going slow enough for you to, for you to do that without getting hurt. And that's what this belief is. It's, it's, it's once you grab a hold of Jesus Christ, it takes you from where you stand to being positionally somewhere else. And where we are before belief is that we're dead in our trespasses and our sins. But when we pastuo, when we believe, when we touch, when we trust Christ, He takes us from being in that position of being dead to being alive in Him. all throughout the Scriptures, church history, and even today, and what will always be is three groups of people that identify themselves with the church. And they are unbelievers, intellectual believers, and true believers. We we looked at this intensely as we walked through the book of Hebrews. And depending on where one is in their walk, it can be very difficult to tell the differences between one or the other or one over the other. Sometimes it can be hard to tell who who is actually a believer, right? Because the church is filled with unbelievers, people that believe only intellectually, and true believers. Concerning unbelievers, like I mentioned last week, I, I spoke about how unbelievers just don't walk through the church of the the. the walk through the door of the church by themselves. They usually are invited by somebody, right? They, they are invited by a family or a friends, or they become, and they become a part of the group which is called the church, whether it's through a, a youth group or, or through some kind of recovery group. They become a part of a core group of people, and they stay around for reasons unknown. Sometimes these are people that you might have, have young children as Baptists. We might... Uh, have young children who we like I can remember when I was eight years old I was baptized and added to the church of my uncle that my uncle preached at I didn't believe <clears throat> my dad just said you're getting baptized and I said okay and so my uncle baptized me I was a part of this this church function this church group right or it can be that you made a false profession you were added to the church through baptism and now you, you, you think you're among the church, or it can be that you were baptized as an infant. What, what, whatever the, 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 cost, the, uh, the situation may be, you can be a part of the church and not really be a believer, not really have this personal faith in Jesus Christ. Concerning intellectual believers, these are those who have a head knowledge of who Jesus is. Like they, they really believe the stories. They may have even had a personal experience or they've witnessed something in their lives and they've seen Jesus move in, in different ways. And they have this belief in Him, but not one that will stand the test of time because it's, it's, it's only a matter of intellect, right? It's, it's, it's an intellectual belief. They don't truly, if you press them, they don't truly believe that that Jesus Christ died and that He was buried and and three days later He actually came out the grave and and, and 40 days after that His, His, His bodily resurrection, like He was actually came out the grave in His body and that that body ascended, like the disciples were actually able to see Him rise from the ground and fly and and, and disappear into the clouds and that he's actually right here now with that body at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercessory for for those that draw near to him. Like 
Like, they don't actually believe that, but they believe the, some of the stories. Like, they have this, they, they believe that there was a man named Jesus who actually lived and, and it was probably a great teacher, right? But they don't actually trust that that really happened. They know the stories, but they don't trust that. Concerning true believers, true believers are those who <clears throat> not only believe intellectually, like, 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 like we, we know the stories, we, we believe the stories, but we actually trust that what Jesus Christ did by raising, by, by what God did by raising Jesus from the dead, like we, we trust that that was done for us. Now the reason why it can be hard to tell who's who sometimes, depending on their walk, is you can have an unbeliever that is a part of the church or an intellectual believer that is a part of the church and they can <clears throat> excuse me and they can seem like they're Christians from the outside right they're they're moral they got good values you know from the outside looking in they can appear to be Christians and then you can have someone who is a true believer who was just born again and he's rough around the edges, or she's rough around the edges, right? He's coming to church. He still wears his gang colors, right? <laughs> he's truly a believer, but he's rough around the edges. Or she's coming to church, and, and, she, and, and, and you know she still has that that strut about her, right? That the world has. We still have we still have that that world on our back. But God actually truly did transform them. Like, like in my case, I can remember after I was born again, still coming. Listen, I still trust. Like if you have conversation with me, there's still a lot of streets in me. Right? The, the way that I talk sometimes. Right? I still have a, a limp when I walk. Right? I cannot take the limp away. I don't know why. I, don't, <laughs> I tell people, it could be because of my left knee, but I, I don't know why. I still got some streets in me. But man, I truly believe what Jesus Christ has done. I truly believe it. And there's people in this room or there's people in other, in, in other churches who you might look at and say, man, they are more, more moral than he is. And they can be unbelievers or just believing intellectually. Right? It, it can be hard to tell depending on where their walk is and how long they've been faking it or how long they've really been in it. Who is a true Christian? The only way to truly know is when trials and tribulations come, when the cares of this world lay their traps. True believers in these times, times of sorrows, times of grief, and also in times of happiness, when things are going good, they are not budged. They believe and they will continue to believe. But as for the non-believer and the intellectual believer, when things don't go their way, they will fall away providing, proving, excuse me, proving their belief was false. So my proposition is this. Someone can believe and not be a believer. You can believe and not be a believer. And I believe that's what our, our text has been teaching us so far as we've walked through this. And, and we're going to see that a lot more, too. And what we have in our text to examine is the royal official, whether or not his belief in Jesus is an intellectual head knowledge or is it an actual change of the heart and mind. So if you would look at our text Chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. <clears throat> and he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a royal, royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judah into Galilee, he went to him and was 
asking him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. And Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. And while he was still going down, his slave met him saying that his son was alive. So he acquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then he said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that that was the very hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come out of Judah into Galilee. The Gospel of John doesn't record every sign that Jesus did. It even tells us the verse right above the one I read earlier that the the, uh, the the main verse that is, is overarching verse of this book that if we were to record everything that he's done, there would be enough books in the world to to hold them. But the signs that he does point out, he, he numbers them, and he tells us that this is the second sign. Our outline for this week. Is very simple. It's, kind of, it's, it's intellectual belief versus true belief. And as we transition being a Christian, and I, I want to watch how I say this because I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm promoting pietism because I'm not. I think pietism is bad. Piety good, pietism bad. But being a Christian is not going alone with the crowd. Right, it's not following everyone um, who might be looking like they're following Christ. Right, it's careful examination. It's not following the crowd, but it is a life lived of dedication to God, a life of repentance and faith, and striving for holiness. It's a life of knowing that when you die. True life begins. That's what, it's knowing when you die that true life begins. It's a life of knowing that at any time you could be put to death for your faith. I know we're in America and it doesn't seem like that could happen, but trust, it can happen. At any t time you could be put to death for your faith. As a Christian, these are things that you have to have in mind. It's you being ready and willing to be put to death for at any time for your faith. This is why it can't be intellectual. Intellectuals are not going to be put to death. Unbelievers are not going to be put to death for something they don't really hope to. For true believers, it's a life. It's living a life looking to Christ. He is our goal. He is where we're walking this journey to. We're in Him, and in an, in an, in an already not yet, we will be with Him. And living a Christian life, it's, 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 it's going towards Him. It's looking to Him. It's that dog race that I keep mentioning. It's focusing our attention on Him. It's believing that, that God entered into time, became a man, lived a perfect life, died as if He was a criminal, and Him being put to death and being raised on the third day was so that you and I could die and so that you and I could live. And it's believing that no matter what. So that's what separates intellectuals, unbelievers, with true believers. No matter what, 
At any time, I could be put to death for this, but at no matter what, this is what I believe, and nothing can change my mind. It's challenging everything that we hear and see, right? When the Bible talks about someone being a Berean, it wasn't an individual with his Bible. It was the church collective. That, that group of people collective gathered together and searched the Scriptures to see if these things be true. That's what we have to do as a body, collectively gathering together, studying the word of God to see if these things be true. This group is saying this, this group is saying this. Well, what does this say? Can we exit the echo chamber, focus on scripture, our confession and church history? This is what we have to do. That's what we're called to do as individual churches is to be Bereans. But personal, at any minute, you could be put to death. That's what you have to understand. And that no matter what, this gospel message, you're ready to die for. It, 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 there's, it's non-negotiable. It's knowing, the Christian life, it's knowing that this is not our home. Right? That's what Abraham was saying. This is not my home. Peter says that we are pilgrims passing through. When we die, true life begins. Our text begins with Jesus making it to Galilee. If you remember, he was on his way to Galilee from Judea when he stopped at Samaria to a, at the city called Shatkar. Our text has him making it to his destination at Cana of Galilee, and the author, John, the, the Apostle John, the author reminds us that, that, that we know where he's, where, he's headed, where he's headed to. We know this land because he reminds us by pointing out that this is where Jesus turned the water into wine. The same place where Jesus turned the water into wine, this is where Jesus is going back to. We saw him leaving there after the wedding. Remember, he left. Now he's returning back. The text tells us that there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. This royal official was most likely a Gentile satyrian in the service of Herod. Herod here would have been the, the king of Judah, and this would have been the Herod who had John the Baptist put to death. Remember, we had John the Baptist confronts Herod in his sexual sin. Herod has him arrested, Herod's, Herod's girlfriend, who was his wife's, I mean, Herod's girlfriend, who was his brother's wife, which would make his brother's daughter, has him to kill John the Baptist. I know it sounds very trailer apart, but that's just how this story is, right? A lot of ancestral things going on. So this is that Herod. And the royal official, this guy who works for Herod, his son was sick to the point of death. And out of desperation, this man comes to Jesus crying for help. This man would have, have to have known that Jesus was some kind of miracle worker. right? He would have to have known that Jesus could perform miracles. Without this knowledge, without this man having some knowledge of who Jesus is and how this Jesus can perform miraculous deeds, this man would have not come to Jesus expecting a miracle. He would have not come to Jesus expecting help. So he comes to Jesus in some kind of a belief. He comes to Jesus out of desperation, out of a desperate faith, believing that Jesus can heal his son. And we see this in verse 40, um, verse 47. It said, when he heard that Jesus came out of Galilee into, yeah, out of Judah into Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. Verse 48, Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never Believe. Now, this brings us to our first point. Intellectual belief. This royal official has 
heard rumors, right? The, the, the only way that he could know that Jesus was able to perform miracles is that he had to have heard rumors. He has heard rumors. He, he knows people who knows Jesus, or he knows people who have seen Jesus perform miracles. His belief can be categorized as a simple head knowledge. So far in our text, so far, we can say that his belief is categorized as a simple head knowledge of who Jesus is and rumors of what he has done. In his head knowledge that he has, it isn't a full revelation of who Jesus is, right? He, he doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't have this full revelation of who Jesus is. He just knows that this Jesus is able to perform miracles. So he goes to him in desperation. He doesn't have a full comprehension of who Jesus is. He doesn't know that he's God incarnated, that he's the second person of the Trinity, that he took on flesh, that he's going to live a life that he couldn't live, was die a death that he should die, be buried and rose again on the third day. He doesn't have this knowledge such as unbelievers in our church today or right? People that are in this church are people that's, if you're in this church and you're, you're not a believer or if you're among other churches and you're not a believer, like you have more knowledge than this, this guy has. And he definitely has more faith than an unbeliever. He knows that Jesus can heal. All this man seems to know is that there's a man named Jesus who can perform miracles. And I would, I would say to this point, he probably hasn't been in a crowd and witnessed it. And he's just going off of what he's heard. Simple, right? He, he, it, it's, a, it's a simple head knowledge of who Jesus is. And then we come to Jesus' response again. I want you to listen to Jesus' response again. Verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Meaning that this faith is not true faith. This, this belief is not a true belief. The belief that Jesus, and I'm going to remind you why I say that. The belief that Jesus is dreadful for this satyrian to have seems to be the type of belief that Nicodemus approached Jesus with. If you remember the conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we, listen, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless... God is with him. This is the kind of belief, this is the kind of faith that Jesus would not entrust himself with. If you only believe because of miracles, Jesus does not entrust himself to that kind of people. You say, well, how do you know that? Look at verse 23 of chapter 2, 23 and 24. Now, when he, remember, this book is about People, he, they want people to, he wants people to believe in him. If you believe in him, you have life. Verse, chapter 2, verse 23. And when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, listen, many people believed in his name. When they saw his signs, which he was doing. So they believed when they saw the signs. Verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. If you're only believing because of the signs, Jesus does not entrust himself to them. And so that's the kind of belief that Jesus does not want this satyrian to have for him. He says, unless you people see signs, you're never going to believe. Now concerning our, this, this conversation we see with Jesus and this royal official, Listen, ladies and gentlemen, all we have is the text, right? All we have is what the text says. And I had to ask myself, could more have been said that the text doesn't record? Could Jesus had explained to him who he was, but the text doesn't record that, right? All we have is the text. The answer is yes, he could have 
explain more to them. There could have been more said than what's revealed in our text. But all we have is the, te- is the text. So more could have happened, but for us to, to say that it happened, for, for me to get up here and say that I'm pretty sure that Jesus walked through the whole point of the gospel with him, it would be pure, pure speculation. It, it, it would be pure speculation. There's no way that I can come up here with confidence and, and, and say that. It's pure speculation. And this brings us to our second point, true belief, or, or, or we could say true faith. True belief or true faith is, is, is something that you get, is, is something that, true belief or true faith is not something that you get from hearing rumors or seeing miracles. True faith is given to you by God through the gospel, and it is the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. It's the revelation of who Jesus is. Is Jesus the, the long-awaited Messiah? Do you believe that? If, if you do, if, 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 if man did not reveal this to you, but his Father who is in heaven reveals to you that Jesus is the Messiah, guess what you have? True faith. And unless this man had that, we, we, we cannot say for sure that he has true faith. Because this gospel is evangelistic. That's what this gospel is. It's evangelistic. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of preachers, a lot of evangelists, they say, if you begin to read the Bible, read the book of John. Read the gospel of John. It's going to tell you who Jesus is. Again, the, the, the overarching message, the overarching verse of this whole gospel, it says, but these things were written so that you may believe. It wants people to believe. Jesus wants people to believe. The author wants people to believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. But it points out false belief. If you only believe because of rumors, if you only believe because of miracles, you do not have life life in His name. You have to believe that He is the Christ. Life and salvation, life and salvation is believing that Jesus is the Christ, meaning that we, we looked at this last week. What does the Christ mean? The anointed one who was anointed the king, the anointed king, speaking of him being the king. And unless this royal official believes that Jesus Christ is the king, guess what the Bible says that's going to happen to him? He will die in his sins. Because there's true faith and there's a false faith. The span of Jesus' ministry, Jesus healed many, many people, and many, peop- many, many people saw his miracles like they were eyewitnesses to his miracles, but very few actually believed and followed Jesus. Very few at the time when Jesus was alive performing these miracles, very few people entrusted themselves to Jesus, put their faith in him, trusted him. Now let's read verses 49 and 50. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. I want you to notice the transition that took place here. I think we can read through this and over this and not notice the transition. The man's belief has gone from rumors of Jesus to believing the word Jesus spoke to him. Right? His belief started out with knowing that he could heal. And then Jesus tells him, go your son as well to trusting that Jesus healed his son. So there's a a transition. There's a growth in his faith. First, he went from believing what others were saying about Jesus. This was the rumors to believing the word Jesus spoke to him himself. So the question is, is that true faith? Is that true faith? I would say it's not. 
verse 51. And while he was still going down, his slave met him and saying that his son was alive. So he inquired of them the hour when his son began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, his fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again, a second sign that Jesus did when he had came out of Judah and Galilee. And I want to be honest here that there's not really much to break down exegetically. The writer here is, is giving us his narrative story of what has happened. And what we see from this story is that the royal official's son was healed the moment Jesus said, go, your son lives. In the story of the Samaritan woman, we saw that the, the sixth hour was 12 noon. So this would have been at the seventh hour. So one o'clock in the afternoon is when Jesus spoke to him. That his son that, that told him that his son go your son lives, and after the royal official found out that his son was healed, remember he had his his, his servant his slave came and told him that his son was healed. It states again that he believed. He started out believing a rumor about Jesus. Then he believed the words spoken by Jesus. And then after that, he believed because of a miracle done by Jesus. You see the growth in his faith? This is quite different than what took place earlier in this chapter. Earlier in this chapter, in chapter 4, when Jesus was at, uh, in, Samaria, in Samaria, Jesus did no miracles. Right? We saw him ask a woman for water. Jesus could have made water fly up out the well into his mouth, right? <laughs> right? I, I, I mean, if I, if I was there, that's probably something that I would have done, right? I mean, if we're honest, not Jesus. He's, he's better than I am. He didn't use his miraculous powers to, to solve his own problems, right? He didn't go there and start healing. The text doesn't tell us that he was in Samaria healing. What it does tell us is that his omniscience was on display. His omniscience, him knowing the state of everything. The woman believed because he told her all things about her. And then he stayed in that area for two days. And for two days, he was speaking to the people in that town, the town of Shekhar. And many, many, many people believed in him, not because of a miracle, but well, because of his omniscience and because of the words that he was speaking to them. In our text, this man believes a rumor, believes the word of Jesus spoken about his son, and then believes because of the miracle Jesus performed. But not only him, it says he believes as well as his whole household. So the question is, is this true faith? And I'm afraid that the text doesn't tell us. The Bible, Jesus warns. Listen, he warns. We just read that warning. He warns. He does not want this man to believe because of sign. Jesus warns about people only believing because of miracles. And in the case of the royal official, we see three instances of how his believing, of how his belief has grown and how it has developed. Some theologians here offer hope for the faith of this man by pointing to the book of Acts and how there's instances in the book of Acts where whole households are believing. So if you turn your attention to the book of Acts, we're going to, let me see the time. Okay, we're good on time. Um, the story actually begins in, in verse 16. Uh, but the, the main part that we'll look at is verse 25. But let's look at, for some context, sake of the context, let's look at chapter 16, 
beginning in 16. This is talking about Paul and Silas. They're, they're going out, they're witnessing. And it says, Now it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a servant girl having a spirit of divination met us and was bringing... Uh, and, and was bringing her matters much, uh, her, her, her ma excuse me, and was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and, and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Now, we, we would say, Well, what's wrong with that? that that's true, right? She, 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 she's definitely speaking truth. And she continued doing this for many days. So apparently she was doing this, but in a mocking way. So she was saying the truth, but it was in a mocking way. But being greatly annoyed, Paul turned and said to, said to the spirit, notice he didn't say to her, he said to the spirit that she was possessed by, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to leave her. And it left her at that very moment. And when her master saw that their hope for profit had left, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them into the, to the chief uh, magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion being Jews and are proclaiming customs that are not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. At this time, they didn't know that Paul was a Roman citizen. And the crowd joined together and attacked them and the chief magistrates, tearing their garments off of them, proceeding to order them to be beaten with rods. Now it's going to pick up on the story of what's taking place here. And when they had inflicted them with many wounds, they threw them into prison, commanding, listen, the jailer, remember that, commanding the jailer to guard them securely, who having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with shackles. Now it comes to what I wanted to point out. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. They were just beaten, they're thrown into prison, and now they're singing hymns and they're praising God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake that the foundations of the jailhouse was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains unfastened. And when the jailer awoke, he saw that the prison doors were open. And he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So he was just warned to, 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 to throw these men in prisons and to make sure they weren't able to escape. He wakes up from, from the commotion, this earthquake, the doors are open. He thinks they escaped, and he knows that he's going to be put to death and punished, so he's about to take his own life. And some of us will say, well, let's let him take his life so we can escape. Look what Paul does. Paul cries out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling, this man is this jailer, trembling with fear, Fear, he falls down before Paul and Silas. And after, and after he brought him out, after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to, to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your house. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his household. 
So right here it tells us that Paul and Silas were in his household and they were able to preach and minister to him as well as his household. So those in his household were able to listen to the message and understand. And he took them that very hour of the night and he washed their wounds and immediately he, speaking of the jailer, was baptized, he and his household. And he brought them into his house and he set them, he set food before them and rejoiced greatly with his whole household because he had believed in God. So theologians would point to this and say, well, since it speaks about households believing as well as him, then we can have hope that this man truly believed. But all we have is the text. If we add anything to it, it's pure speculation. We're only assuming. In the case of the Philippian jailer, I mean, right here, we hear Paul ministering to him and his family. The gospel message. And God, through that message, causes this man in his household to believe. In the case of the royal official, again, all we know is as far as we know, Jesus did not give himself over to him. Right? If we're just going with what we have, as far as we know, this is what we have. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not up here trying to, to, to make a, a judgment call. I'm just saying from what we have in the text, those that believe according to miracles, Jesus does not entrust himself to them. And that's all we have. So I'm not going to I'm not trying to put this man in hell nor am I trying to put him in heaven. I'm, I want to be faithful to the text. My goal here today is to, is to not to throw him in hell and it's not to to put him in Christ, but it's to show you the differences between a false profession and a true profession. A false belief and a true belief. Because someone can believe and not be a believer. This man believed the rumors he believed the word Jesus spoke to him, and he believed because of the miracle. None of that shows us that he had true faith in Jesus Christ. A true profession of belief begins with believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what it comes down to. That's what you have to believe in order to be a Christian. A true belief in Jesus Christ is faith. It's trusting that Jesus, what Jesus Christ has done, he did it for you. And that is more than just simply knowing that Jesus existed and believing stories about him. It's, it, it, it's grabbing that trolley and him taking you from being dead in your trespasses and sins to being alive with him in Christ. It's grabbing a hold of him and taking and him taking you unto himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I pray this day that you have that kind of faith in Jesus. Because I know churches are filled with unbelievers, intellectual believers, and true believers. We're a small church, and I pray that each and every one of us who is of that age that's able to make that profession has, has or will do so. So that you can go from a head knowledge of who He is to being conformed into the image of His Son. And I'm available Pastor Cal, Josh, let's pray. Our Father and God, Lord, we love you. And we're so thankful that you have given us your word. Lord, we just ask that your blessings be upon us, be upon your word, Lord, that was just spoken. I pray, Lord, that you have um, awakened those here that might be unbelievers or that might be intellectual believers and that you have given them true insight through this message of what true belief is. But not only that, that through their insight, Lord, that you have give to them true faith, that they have reached out and grab Jesus, and that now they are in Him. Lord, we pray over this supper that we're about to receive. 
And God, we just pray that you will use this bread and wine and bless it, and that you will use it for the for our being conformed into his image. And we love and trust that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.